Martin Hase is our third panel speaker today. Martin Hase is a university lecturer in the field of civil, commercial, corporate and innovation law, again at the uh, Technical University Berlin, but that's a coincidence, so it's not on purpose. Um, he has gained professional and scientific experience as a research associate at the Institute for Legal Informatics at the Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz University of Hanover. This is where we know each other from. And as an independent and employed lawyer in Berlin with a specialization on data protection law and information security law in the health sector. His doctoral thesis, this is the reason why he's invited, uh, his doctoral thesis, which has won several awards, uh, focused on an examination of the material scope of European data protection law with an in-depth analysis of the concept of personal data. Martin, so good to have you with us. Uh, you have the floor. Thank you for coming. Thank you very much for this warm uh, welcome. Um, hello to everybody. Thank you to Michelle and Frank for this great presentations, uh, which will help me to give my presentation. So my subject will be identification on natural persons in the context of data protection law. And actually, um, I wanted to introduce myself as follows. So I don't know perhaps, but I'm also working on various anonymization techniques. But since my expertise in the field of computer science is relatively low, I have chosen a pragmatic way. Huh? So my name is Beep. I'm an astronaut, plumper, or university lecturer living in a European capital with the initial letter B and a person, as you already have heard, who first identified me in 2002, asked me to give a lecture on the concept of personal data today. And um, of course, I accepted the request with pleasure or with regret. So, but since you already identified me, it is not necessary anymore. And I think it's much nicer to watch into the eyes of each other. So I would like to start my presentation, my slides, um, and we'll go on. So, no, you should see my slides and I hope you um, can Works, hear Yes, yes. Me as all well. fine, all fine, Martin. Okay, great. So the subject is identification of a natural person in the context of data protection law. Um, and that is what you already have seen. Um, Michelle has said, if you talk about personal data and anonymization, you have to look at the law. That's right. Uh, Frank has told us, and that's also right, that we have to do the math. And yeah, I uh, would say perhaps if you deal with anonymization and the concept of personal data, you also have to look at the philosophy behind this concept. So let me start with the um, background of the concept of personal data. So uh, from a legal perspective, and uh, as a lawyer, my perspective is a legal perspective, today uh, we are in the area of data protection law. And data protection law is a very old material. Uh, data protection law in a broader sense has developed over several centuries. As you see on the slide, for example, the so-called Hippocratic Oath was already written down, I think, 2000 years ago. In addition, we had uh, um, in law a development of the protection of special spheres like the postal secrecy um, and also the privacy. And the privacy um, is that what you yeah, see around me today. Um, because what is the reason why I tell this to you? Um, I mention this because due to the corona pandemic, I have been holding my data protection lectures and presentations uh, since April out of my bedroom. And what you see in the background is my bedroom. And I think uh, that is very funny um, because uh, there is perhaps a conflict between data protection law and bedroom, but 
uh, you will see during my presentation uh, at the end. It's not. So as a data protection expert and also educator, it, it's important for me that my children, and that's also part of my bedroom here, that my children learn to know the protection fears, so the spheres or places or the rules uh, regulation of their protection in a very early stage. And therefore, I have written a sign on our door. So if my children go out, they see attention, you are leaving the area of your privacy. Um, and the answer came promptly, but don't worry, data protection law, European data protection law accompanies you is always on your side. So what would I like to show with this um, slide is that um, the data protection law in a broader sense, so the protection of privacy, uh, has a lot of weaknesses. In my case, uh, it's um, the case that I am not in a protected area half of the day or around half of the day. And I'm often leaving my bedroom, not in the last semester. <laughs> I spent a lot of time, <laughs> much more time in the bedroom than before. But um, nevertheless, I'm often leaving this protected sphere um, because if I go through my door, um, the, this protection is, um, is not anymore there or it's even uh, much weaker. And therefore, well, that's one reason why we have the GDPR and why we have the concept of personal data which came into the law um, uh, around 50 years ago. And, and with this concept, also the terms identifiability, uh, anonymization, uh, personal data, information about a natural person um, uh, were introduced uh, into the law. And um, since then, we have to deal on this criterion. And we have realized that this criterion is really broad and is always being on our side. So every information which can be linked to an identified or identifiable natural person is personal data. I think to understand the concept of personal data, it's also important to um, understand the context um, as it all also already was explained in the speeches before. Um, so my starting point is also the definition, uh, which you actually find in the GDPR of personal data. Uh, what personal data means, any information relating to an identified or identifiable natural person. And as um, Michelle were focusing on the question uh, of anonymization and identifiability, and Frank was uh, focusing on the technical aspects of uh, depersonalization and uh, identi de identification, so anonymization, uh, I would like to concentrate on the question, when is a natural person identified? Because if you look at the literature and also at the uh, court decisions, then they were thinking or are very often and uh, thinking about the identifiability, but um, I think it, uh, the people haven't thought enough about the step before the question, when is a natural person identified? Uh, for the scope, it's not so important because you also have personal data if you just have an identifiable natural person, but nevertheless, a uh, step before the identifiability is the identification. And the background of, um, of uh, information or, or of uh, data protection or the background our world is that you could separate or distinguish our world into three levels. Uh, and that is very important for the concept of personal data. So personal data is information. And as we have heard, it's any information. That is very broad. Um, the term information is uh, controversial, discussed um, 
in a lot of disciplines um, and is highly disputed what information is. But from a perspective of data protection law, you can see that it's really broad and uh, almost every data, every information, everything, what could even be information falls under this definition of personal data. We have a second level as it is, is the reality. So that what is happening around us in the real world and the information, um, they, the information um, refers to this reality. So these two levels and people have learned, and that's very natural and very important, people know to transfer reality into data and information. And they are doing that to understand, to foresee, or to react. So we have information and for information always refer to reality. Reality is transferred into data and information. The aim is of the people to understand, to foresee, to react. That is the background of the concept of personal data. And in the last years, we have seen that we had a high development in the information technologies um, and especially in the information science and in the computer science, so that people are more and more able to understand reality and to transfer it into, into information and to calculate reality, uh, to be able to understand, to foresee and to act, to react, and at the end, get data power. I have a little excursus. Um, perhaps you have seen the serious deaths um, or at least you have heard about it. There were several articles on it um, and a discussion um, about it. Um, just a short summary. Um, the series is about a company that calculates the past and the future based on the belief in determinism using quantum computers. And Due to this, they get a lot of powers. So that is not exactly the question of identification, but for me, the series is an indication that a broad audience is interested in the question about the ongoing of decoding and predictability of reality. And that's very important because that's something what happens. I personally, I'm not a follower of that determinism, but I think it's worthwhile to follow the trains of thought because also me, I experienced even without determinism, our reality is strongly influenced by inter effects. So um, there is a growth of understanding of reality and transferring it to information and to understand it. Also like um, Frank uh, demonstrated it very well, um, the technical possibilities are growing a lot. And for the concept of personal data and the concept of identifying natural person, it's important because the more we know about reality, the more we are able to identify people. Uh, and I guess that this development will go on further. Uh, by the way, just mentioned, if our world really were strictly deterministic, we would not need to think about the protection of personal freedom and the right of data protection today because freedom would not exist. But it's just um, an example to show you um, how important these levels are and uh, how much we are and perhaps will be able as people, as humans, to understand reality transferred. And at the end, and that's very important to get data power because as more information we have, and as more we understand, um, we get more data power. And of course, it could be used for good things, this data power, but there's also a risk of misuse or other negative impairments. And that we need to know to understand the concept of personal data and perhaps to find criterions how to define 
identification of a natural person. The concept of personal data, as already was um, mentioned, opens the material scope of the GDPR uh, and opens the regulation, um, how you could process this data and uh, what the processor um, have to take into account. And um, the aim of personal data must be to open the scope for all the situation where a risk of misuse or other negative impairments arise. And also it must be a aim that this concept of personal data do not, do not open the scope in that situation where you don't have any data power or any risk of misuse or negative impairments. So um, we can concretize, say something to reality. Um, it can be seen as nature, humans, and their creations. Um, and another important aspect, according to reality, also important for the concept of personality, uh, personal data and identification is as a separation and the distinguishing of human and non-human because identification in the context of data protection law always means identification of a living human. The technical term is natural person. Um, and so it's important to distinguish what is a natural person, what is a living human and what is non-human. But we have to be careful because there, as I already told you, there are interactions um, between natural persons and physical objects, animals, force of nature. So in reality, or in our world, information about a physical object or an animal uh, or something else could also be information of natural person. And a natural person therefore can also be identified uh, from information which seems to be from a first view uh, information about a physical object. At the end, you have so, um, people transfer reality into information to understand, to foresee, to react. Um, and this information and this reactions uh, become reality again. Um, so that is the, the background, what really happens and the task of the law to deal on this. Um, I just met some symbols into this slide, which will help us to remember it on the next slides. And my focus now will be on the question, when is the natural person identified in this context? What are the criterions of identification? Uh, which information do we need about a natural person, a hum living human, that we can say, okay, this living human is identified. Uh, first step could be to look at their decisions, at the jurisprudence, um, what the courts have said, and they haven't said a lot uh, according to this term. So the ECG, uh, it was Lindquist, I think, said, okay, a natural person is, is, um, um, is identified if it is clearly recognizable. Uh? So if I put my glasses, I can recognize someone. And if I take them, I could not perhaps recognize a person. So I think that is not much saying. Then another court decision said um, identification is if they directly, if the information directly reveal the identity of the natural person. So there they took Another word for identification, I uh, took the word identity. So um, identification is if you have information on the identity, it helps a little bit. Uh, more helpful is the literature. And um, I just took um, also this um, working paper 136 of the article 29 data protection working paper, just some hints. Um, within a group of persons, someone is distinguished from all other members of the group 
in this situation, this person is identified. So um, we have to single someone out. Uh, if we have information just about one person, uh, I would say if we have a unique combination, unique information. I think the core criterion is the uniqueness, the unique combination. And I think it's uh, the best way to work with this term. And now I brought some of my thoughts into the slides. So of course, there's a lot of more literature about this subject uh, just um, because of the time um, I, I put some off of the slide. Now, I would like to explain my thoughts about identification. So on the left side, you see um, the situation that we have no identification uh, in red and um, in yellow, you see the situation that we have identification. So um, I have some thesis and if you say no, then you come more to the area of no identification. And if you say yes, um, then you came to the situation of identification. And um, it is that we not can say it clearly every situation. Sometimes we have a person which is clearly identified and sometimes we have information where no identification happens and sometimes yeah we are in the area where we cannot really decide clearly um, i want to show it to you with some examples so i think that's always important yeah, to rethink uh, our terms and criterions just by discussing some examples and uh, giving you the chance to also think about this question when a person is identified, a natural person. Uh, for example, a tissue sample of a living human is sent to the US. Uh, so we could say um, this is no personal data on the one hand because we have no information. I don't think so. I think we have information about an identified person. And if you see what is the first question I would raise, is there a given information relates to something non-human? No. Is there a given information probably relates to a living human? No, because we have no information. But is there a natural information carrier relates to a natural person? And that question I would answer with yes. So there's a possibility to have information relate to an identified natural person. The second very important question would be, is the information or the information on the carrier probably, or is it unique to one existing human? In our example, it's the case. Does it contain a description of the humans that also lead me to an identification? Um, that's the case because the sample uh, has a description of the human and it's not just uh, possible to identify a natural person by the sample. Um, it's, uh, you could even uh, get more information about this living human person. Um, there's a possibility, probability linking further information to the human. Why has it given information? Yeah, um, yeah, we could take more information from the sample. Um, at, at the end, I would say uh, there's also risk if the fundamental rights could be restricted by using this um, sample. So I would say we have information relate to a natural person. Another example, nuclear waste repository is being built in Spandau. In my view, that would not be personal data because there's no natural person identified. Um, the first question we would answer was yeah, yes, uh, given information relates to something non-human. Yeah, that's true. It's about a nuclear waste repository, but probably it also gives information which relate to living humans, um, the living humans who are living in the neighborhood. Yeah? If we assume that there are negative effects from this nuclear waste repository, then it could have 
an influence of the health of people living around. But that's already a probability and that's not a fact. So we do not know it really, it's, it's disputed, but uh, some people assume that these effects are existing. Is it unique to one existing human? No, because it's a thing and it's just a repository in Spandau. Is there probably given only to each, so that the information is only to each member of a group? Then you could argue, of course, there are there is a group of people living around the nuclear waste repository, but it's not specific enough. And it's even not sure yeah, at the end, if there is a, a high restriction of fundamental rights, therefore I uh, would come to the answer, we have no identification. No? Um, of course, we would have an additional knowledge. Uh, we could know who's living in Spando, um, what I already told you. Okay, uh, next information also about a group. And I would say this, even if it is a group, in this information, it would be personal data and information about an identified natural person. If you get the information, everyone in Friedrichshain Kreuzberg is infected with Corona. Uh, and then of course we would have, or would need the additional information um, who is living in Friedrichshain Kreuzberg, but that's available. So this is clearly a given information which relates to a living human and if we assume that it is a fact, so it's still a probability because we don't know if, um, so the, the tests are not uh, always true, but we have a high probability that this given information relates to one or more living human, but it's no information which is unique to one existing human. So this uniqueness according to one existing human is not necessary because it's also enough for identify a natural person, in my opinion, if it is information probably given only to each member of a group. Um, and if we have the information, everyone who lives in Friedrichshain Kreuzberg, they have a high probability that this is true for everyone, also for me. Of course, the information contains a description of the human. Um, there's a possibility to link further information to the human if we know where he lives. Um, and other information. And as we also see at the moment, there's a possibility and a risk that the natural person is restricted, restricted in his fundamental rights based on the information. Next example, in Friedrichshain Kreuzberg, the Corona seven day incidence on Monday um, is 118.1. Now that is a little bit different. So at the end, I would say this is no personal data, but you can discuss it. So it's also a given information probably relates to a living human, again, to a group of living human, but not, it's not unique to an existing human. And I don't know if it's given only to each member of a group because it's just saying that in a group, there are some people um, who are infected with Corona. The question perhaps would be, can this example, this information can be expressed as unique to one existing human, um, also as a probability, because if I'm living in Friedrichshain Kreuzberg um, and there is this high incidence, it's also telling something about me as a unique existing human, um, but it's more an assumption than a fact. And that would lead me um, tendence, in a tendency to say there's no identification. But another information example, 10% or 64% or 96% of people living in Friedrichshain Kreuzberg um, or in a special street are infected with HIV. Um, it's different, I would say, if you have the information 96% of people living in uh, Hauptstraße in Berlin are infected with HIV. You have um, personal data because we have a given information relates to human or to a living human or uh, several humans. 
with a probability, of course, because it's 96% probability, but it's a very high probability. Um, it's not given to each member because 4% are not HIV positive, but it can be expressed as unique to one existing human. Because if I'm living in Friedrichshain, Kreuzberg, and we have a 96% probability of HIV infection, then it's also probability according to me as a unique person. Then the statistic or the probability that I am HIV positive is 96%. And so um, there's a description in this information and also a possibility to restrict my fundamental uh, rights. And um, this information, um, in my point of view, would be personal data. What you see with these examples is that we often have probabilities. Yeah? So we have no facts about people. Someone ha has a hobby swimming. Yeah? It's What does it say about someone? Yeah? It's um, it's the probability. And also this identification, We sometimes we just have a probability of relating to a living human, relating to a unique um, living human. And so we already have a risk-based approach, Michel spoke about, already in the question, what is identification? Uh, because also a probability of identification sometimes has, in my view, uh, seen as an identification. Uh, and you also see that the border is not strict. So when this information in this example is personal data, if there are 10 persons in Friedrichshain Cosmat, 12 persons, um, 20 percent, 64 percent, 96 percent, 99.9 percent. .9%. So um, it's hard to say, and of course the law does not answer it. Another example: exact location of a cell phone or motor vehicle. Just to show you, it could also a natural person could also be identified. If we have information from the first view, it's given information which relates to something non-human. But then we have to raise the question, um, is there also information which probably relates to a living human? And according to the cell phone, we have the information if we have the place of the cell phone. So it's quite exactly the place of the cell phone. But also probably we assume that it also tells me something about the place of a unique living human, because a lot of people always take their cell phone uh, with them. And then it, this information about a uh, non-human thing can get information um, to identify a natural person. Another example, I've just two or three more, there is just one natural person. Hey, high is 180, brown eyes, hoppy is swimming. Ah, it's given information relates to a living human because it's saying there's just one natural person. Um, that also, also is something we often have to assume. Uh, we even don't know. So if I would not say there's just one natural person, I would have given you just the uh, information, high 180, brown eyes, hoppy swimming, then you would even not know if there are two persons uh, who fit this information, if there are 10 persons. So even uh, the question, is there just a unique natural person behind this data is a difficult question. Um, so I would say uh, here in our example, it's unique to one existing human. Um, the information contains a description of the human. Then we, in this example, we have to ask, is there additional knowledge so Michelle talked about it, the means, the recital 26. So if you would be Facebook um, and this natural person would have an account at Facebook, uh, I would be sure that Facebook would, could identify this person. And so for Facebook, it would be uh, identified natural person. So our knowledge about reality and the methods of measuring reality uh, improve are improving. And um, perhaps we would be able one day to measure the high of a person that it is unique. Uh, so then we have just one information unique to uh, existing living human. So if I would give you there's a single natural person with a high of 17758439232, 
then it could be, or it is information which relates to a living human and it is unique to one existing human. The next question would be, does the information contains a description of a human? Can we say, oh, it's very tall, he's very fast. I would um, employ this person. So we have not a lot of description, not a lot of information in this information. And there's also the question, if we have no other information stored anywhere in this world linked with um, further information about this uh, unique person, um, then it's very hard to identify this. I, even if I know that there in this world is a person with this high, I cannot influence them. I cannot contact him. I cannot grab him. Well, um, so I would doubt that it is, um, identif is information about an identified person. So I would say there's no identification that would change if someone has additional information. So if someone in this world would store this high and would say, okay, he's living in Berlin, he's a carpenter um, and so on. Well, okay, I think um, I'm running out of time. I have several um, uh, further examples, um, but you could, um, could have hundred of these examples. I, I think it's good uh, to, to think um, about single cases and to think about criterions for identification. Um, and, and I think it's missing. And I think it would help a lot for the question, what is personal data and when do we have personal data? If we could exactly say when a natural person is identified. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Martin. Very much appreciated. Again, the question is whether there is a technical question directly uh, for the speaker at the moment, but I don't think that I see one. Um, I don't see any, which is good because we are a little bit late. Um, so I would suggest to have now a coffee break of uh, 10 minutes um, and that we should come back at, t let's say, 10 minutes past 12, uh, which would then... Uh, bring us into the position to have 50 minutes of panel debate. That's good. Okay, so kindly grab your coffee or your drink or whatever and come back here at 10 minutes past 12, but not without before doing that, uh, applauding again to all three panelists and also to Martin. Thank you very much for this. Um, I think we have a big, big overview about many of the issues from different perspectives and we have plenty of food for thought now for the debate. May I ask the speakers to read the questions um, that were put either in the chat and in the Q&A section before coming back at 10 minutes past 12. Thank you so much for the meantime. See you then. Take care. Thank you.